segunda palestra magna do dia e eu vou passar para falar em inglês para poder apresentar a nossa palestrante, Dra. Janet Wink. Uh, Dr. Janet Wink is the Evanescent Director of the Data Science Institute and Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. Uh, before that, from 2013 to 2017, she was a Corporate Vice President of Research at Microsoft. Before that, she was uh, Assistant Director from 2007 to 2010. She was Assistant Director of the Computer Information Science Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. For our managers of agents here, should be a little jealous. I think that directorate budget is about $1 billion. dollars. So uh, just one seventh of one agents and gets $1 billion dollars of uh, funding for, to provide for research. Uh, she has been also a professor at, at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh for about 30 years. She was twice head of the computer science department. She received all her academic degrees from MIT. And I'm going to read now because that's more detail. Professor Wing's general research interests are in the areas of trustworthy computing, specification and verification, concurrent and distributed systems, programming languages, and software engineering. Her current interests are in the foundations of security and privacy with a new focus on trustworthy AI. One of the very important contributions of Janet was the creation of the concept of computational thinking. It was a paper published in 2006, and she said, computational thinking is the thought process involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solutions in such a way that a computer, human or machine, can effectively carry out. She went further to a vision, and the vision, she said, my grand vision is that computational thinking will be a fundamental skill just like reading, writing, arithmetic, used by everyone by the middle of the 21st century. She is a member of many academic government and industry advisory boards. She received the Computation Computer Research Association Distinguished Service Award in 2011 and the Association of Computer Machinery Distinguished Service Award in 2014. She's a fellow And I put IEEE first because I was president of IEEE. She's a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, of the American Association for the Advance of Science, and of the American Academy of Arts and Science. I would like to say something more I, before I give the floor to Jeanette. Last year, I gave a, in this meeting, I gave a talk about the return of investment, uh, of, of investment in science technology and R&D. And there I had a slide. And this slide had a quotation from a Jeanette blog uh, when she was Microsoft vice president. And I felt it was very interesting because a person from industry uh, giving this type of statement, as you will see, it will be very, very rare in Brazil and even less likely from a, one of our politicians. She said, the pursuit of fundamental scientific research is key to building and maintaining economic prosperity, global competitiveness, and national security. It's equally important to building a talented workforce. After all, it's people who generate the ideas that then lead to technology innovation. Investing in faculty and students means ensuring a robust talent pipeline for the future. So I wish our uh, industry uh, uh, managers and also our politicians would think the same way, and with that, Jeanette, please, the floor. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful introduction. Uh, just for the funding agency people in the room, I just wanted to know that he, um, he basically um, rounded up the budget uh, I had at the National Science Foundation. It was more on the order of $685 million, uh, but that was still a lot of money, and I was very grateful for that kind of budget to fund computer science research in the United States uh, while I was there. Um, so I am also very happy to be here. This is a beautiful museum, beautiful day uh, here in Rio, and so thank you very much for 
asking me to be here. It's, it's quite an honor to speak to the Brazilian National Academy of Sciences. Um, it was a very hard invitation uh, to, uh, to, to turn down, so I, I said yes. So anyway, I'm going to talk about data science at Columbia University. Uh, before I start telling you about data science at Columbia University, I wanted to share with you the bigger picture. And I am going throughout the, my talk to try to relate some of my remarks to some of the remarks that Jeff Dean mentioned this morning. So let's start with the data life cycle. Uh, it's important to understand where all this data is coming from. So the very uh, first step in the data life cycle is on the left, and that's generation of data. People generate data. All of us generate data. Every website we visit, every link we click on, every movie we watch, every purchase we make online, but also not just the digital footprint we leave, the physical footprint we leave, every location we go to because our phone is tracking our location, every interaction we have in the store, every transaction, everything we buy in the physical world, every transaction we have in the roads, in the buildings, believe it or not, all of that is being tracked. It's all our digital footprint. And that's data that we people, we generate. I think all of us are quite aware of the third parties that collect all this information and what sorts of interesting things they can do with that information. But it's not just people who generate data. It's devices and sensors all around us uh, making our city smart, making this building, this auditorium smart. Uh, my guess is that these lights are sense, sense the people in the room, they go on when there are people in the room, they go off when, no one, when there's no one in the room. So sensors and devices are everywhere. Sensors and devices are now in your home, in smart meters that are determining how much electricity we're using, how much electricity goes to each of the appliances in our home, and then also these devices that we put, maybe not you, but some of us put in our kitchen or our living room, listening to us every time we say, hey Alexa, uh, what's the weather out? That's a smart device. So they're generating tons and tons of data as well. There's another kind of uh, object that I wanted to remind everyone that generates lots of data too. And that are, that, that's what I call one of very costly scientific instruments. And to an audience like this, I think you would greatly appreciate my reminding the world that we scientists um, often do our science through these very large, one of, very costly scientific instruments. I'm talking about large telescopes, the Large Hadron Collider, neutrino detectors in the South Pole. These are one of, very expensive scientific instruments generating tons and tons of data. And one of the reasons I mentioned this particular kind of generator is that there's a lot of interest right now in AI and machine learning. There was a whole talk about machine learning by Jeff Dean at Google this morning. But people forget that the kind of algorithms and the kind of techniques that machine learning is so good at, is not they're not necessarily good at analyzing the kind of scientific data that is generated by these scientific instruments. In fact, I feel there's a gap between the success of all these phenomenal machine learning algorithms and the kind of data that the scientists are generating. And it would be wonderful to bridge that gap, to, see, to invent new methods that would be particularly germane to scientific data. So that's generation. And by the way, I'm not going to spend the whole hour on this slide. <laughs> after, after we generate data, we collect it. And we often don't collect all the data we generate. We have some kind of filter before um, we actually then uh, process the data. Processing data, by that I mean data wrangling, data cleaning, but I also mean data compression and encryption. And all of those processes happen before we actually store the data uh, on, on uh, hard drive, on tape, on disks, uh, whatnot. So that's when we actually lay the bits out in memory. Data management has to do with laying out the bits in memory such that further processing on those bits can be done efficiently. So that's what you usually study in database courses or data management courses. And then finally, there's analysis. When people think about data science, they really think about data analysis. Or maybe I should put it this way. When people think about data science, they often only 
mean data analysis. They often only think of AI, machine learning, data mining, and so on. And I want you to understand that when I talk about data and data science, I really think about the whole life cycle. Um, and, and fortunately, you heard a, a deep dive this morning by Jeff Dean on machine learning. And just think about that as state of the art of the data analysis techniques that the community has invented. Next is data visualization. It's not at all enough to spit out numbers like 0 0.8 uh, probability, I think, is a cat, or 0 0.9 probability, I think, it's a monkey. Um, it's it's um, important to actually visualize these numbers or whatever these machine learned models and data analysts and analytical techniques spit out. And so that's where data visualization comes in. Um, and then finally, there's data interpretation. It was not until I joined Columbia University, which has a premier journalism school, that I came to appreciate this part of the data life cycle. Because if I showed you a bar chart or a pie chart, um, you'd, you'd say, well, what am I supposed to get out of this? Not until I tell you a story and interpret the data for you and interpret the visualization for you will you understand the point of it all. And later in my talk, I'm going to give you a, an example of a beautiful visualization that's completely meaningless until I tell you the story about it. And of course, there's a person at the end. I like to think there's still a person at the end and not a bot. And the person at the end is the, the decision maker. Um, the person at the end is the clinician who will collaborate with this machine learn model and decide, how should I treat this patient best? So there's still a person at the end who's making that decision, who's using the predictive capability of data analytics and data science um, in a meaningful way. I also like to emphasize the privacy and ethical concerns throughout this entire process. Um, I care uh, very much about making sure that the data scientists that we train for the future understand about ethical concerns, privacy concerns, um, as they're learning the field uh, and not um, after they're asked to testify in front of Congress. Okay, I, I, that was a joke. <laughs> so now let me tell you very succinctly, what do I mean by data science? Data science is the study of extracting value from data. And there are two important words about this definition. And it's a high level definition, but I think it succinctly captures all of the ways in which people try to define data science. The two important words are, first, value. And value is very much subject to the domain expert. So for a scientist, value is detecting that neutrino event by that neutrino detector in the South Pole. Value is discovering new knowledge. Value is advancing state of the art because you are using some kind of data-driven technique and you made a new discovery. Value to a company is easier to explain. It's calculable. There's a bottom line. If it makes me more money, it's valuable. Simple as that. So that's why for companies, especially in the IT sector, they care a lot about how much user engagement there is with a product or service. They care a lot about how many times you click on links um, because they make money on that. Uh, in fact, as you know, they make money on the val they make money on the data they collect about us. So we are giving them value. One might ask what value are we getting in return? The second important word is extracting. Extracting, I, I like because it suggests there's a lot of hard work to get this value out of this data. And in fact, that entire life cycle that I showed in my earlier slide goes to show that a lot of hard work is involved. Each stage in that data life cycle uh, is, a, is a lot of work. What I now like to share with you is my three-part mission statement for the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. The first part is advance the state of the art in data science. This is about basic research. This is about pushing the frontiers of the field. Uh, and What's interesting about this part of the mission statement is that data science itself is a new emerging field. It's still defining itself. Uh, and I'd love to be able to say, 10 years looking back, that Columbia University helped define the field of data science. And what's unique to Columbia is 
At Columbia University, we define the foundations of data science based on three pillars of strength, computer science, statistics, and operations research. Because at Columbia, we have a very strong operations research department in the engineering school, and also a very strong operations research group in the business school. And they actually work together, they know each other, they collaborate with each other. So unique to Columbia, data science foundations is based on these three pillars. Whereas at most universities, you have computer science and statistics coming together. So this is one of the great strengths of Columbia University. The next part of my mission statement speaks to the full-fledged nature of Columbia University, which has a journalism school, a law school, a business school, a medical school, all the arts and sciences departments, all the engineering departments. We have a school of social work. We have a school of public health, dentistry, nursing. You name it, we have it. And so the second part of my mission statement is transform all fields, professions, and sectors through the application of data science. And what was really refreshing to me when I first came to Columbia, and I just joined last summer, is that I thought I would have to go around and talk to all the deans and chairs and faculty all throughout campus and cajole them into understanding that data science was in their future. But it was just the opposite. They all came to me and said, Jeanette, I am sitting on this most interesting data set. I really need your help. I need your data science expertise to help me unlock the value in the data I'm sitting on. So this is, a, of course, a good problem to have when there's a lot more demand than supply. But it showed to me that Columbia University already got data science. E data science literally touches every corner of the university. And finally, the third part of my mission statement is to ensure the responsible use of data to benefit society. To benefit society really speaks to tackling societal grand challenges, whether it's energy or environment or climate change, healthcare, and even education. And that, to me, is something that I think appeals to the sensibilities of the kinds of students and faculty who come to Columbia University. But the part that I really like to emphasize in this mission statement is ensure the responsible use of data. This was way before Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and all the horror stories that we read about daily on the front page of the newspapers. Um, and, I, and this really goes to speak of why I really want to promote the fair and ethical use of data as we're training data scientists so that it becomes second nature to them when they're on the job. So I like to summarize my mission statement into three words, data for good. And by that, I mean two things, obviously. Data to do good, and data use it well. We are over 300 affiliated faculty um, across 12 different schools at Columbia University. I named many of those schools already. Um, it's quite an impressive uh, and exciting time to be at Columbia when there's so much enthusiasm for data science on campus. We are very loosely structured around the centers that are thematic. So I already mentioned foundations, computer science, statistics, and operations research. We have a cybersecurity center, a center on data, media, and society, with, which is joint with journalism, art, and architecture, a center on business and financial analytics, which is joint with the business school, health analytics, which really involves all the medical and health-related fields on campus, Smart cities, we have a center on that um, that includes people from urban planning and architecture. Um, we have a center on Sense, Collect, and Move, which is more at the device level and networking level, wi um, wireless and so on. We have a very strong center in computational social science because Columbia has um, traditionally been very strong in sociology, economics, political science, and so on. Um, we have a new center in computing systems, which is about computer architecture from the hardware all the way up the stack to support data-driven science, the kind of science I was talking about earlier when I talked about large scientific instruments. And we have a nascent materials discovery analytics center. We have a master's program that's been ongoing for a few years now. It's a very popular program. This year, we had a 42% increase in the number of applicants. Um, so there's high demand, high interest in data science, at least in the United States. Um, 
our, our uh, graduates are all placed. They go to great companies. Many of them stay in New York and work in the finance dis uh, sector. But you can see that they work for startups, they work for government agencies, they work for nonprofits, they work for big companies, small companies, in all different kinds of sectors. We also have a very strong industry affiliates program. This is just a snapshot of some of the companies that have joined our program in the past couple of years. Um, just this morning, I learned that Baidu just joined our program, and that uh, that's the second Chinese company that has joined. Alibaba was the first. I would more than uh, welcome Brazilian companies to join the industry affiliates program. One of the advantages you one of the advantages you get at being an industry affiliate is to work with our students, work with our students quite directly. Um, and what we have for our master's program is what we call a capstone course, where groups of uh, students, usually around three to four students, work on a real world data set that an industry affiliate brings to them. And then they are basically uh, expected to deliver some interesting results based on that real world data set to that industry affiliate. So often the company comes in with a model that needs to be built or questions to be asked and answered, or the, com the company itself might have customers uh, and then they are using a data set specific for that customer. So it's a very uh, robust program. Um, we continue to uh, grow it, and it's one of the more popular parts of our master's program. Let me just give you one, uh, two examples of uh, co the kinds of projects that our students in our master's program have done with industry affiliates. This is an example from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, the problem is uh, when, when there's a lot of rain or snow in New York City, the trash that builds up on the streets gets washed out into the Atlantic Ocean. This is not a good idea. So th the hope is that if we can find out where those, the, the trash piles up, then we can get get rid of that trash before the rains and the snow uh, deliver them to the Atlantic Ocean. So this was a piece of work that was done by collecting lots of data sources, publicly available, to basically map New York City's trash hotspots. And then we would know, or the Department of Environmental Protection would know, where to send the resources to collect the trash first. As a completely different example, this is an example working with a, um, a legal team. Um, as you know, lawyers, when they are, have a case, they will like to look at what has happened in the past, both to see if there's precedent set for the case at hand, or to figure out the best strategy to win the case. So what this team did was basically comb through all the case history, case law, using data from the UN Office of Drugs and Crimes, to be able to uh, provide a dashboard to the lawyers so that they can do that kind of str strategic planning. And uh, so this was the Synergic Partners. Um, our data science faculty and students have created, gone off to create a lot of startups. This is one of the um, uh, expectations of the Data Science Institute at Columbia to help feed the tech community in New York City. So what I want to spend the rest of my time on is to tell you some stories about the research that we do at the Data Science Institute through all our partners uh, across the university. And I'm going to do it uh, through the framing that I shared with you, my mission statement. The first part of the mission statement, if you remember, is advanced state of the art in, in data science. And there are really two ways one advances the state of the art. One is to provide theoretical understanding for what seems to work in practice. And the other is to invent new methods and new techniques um, to solve problems that you didn't know about or that you're inventing yourself. I'm going to give you an example of the first kind. And this is the problem of expectation maximization. Um, I suspect many of you here in the audience know what expectation maximization is. Great. So um, the backdrop of the story is, if I wanted to, let's see how I'll, I do this. It was easier at the university. Um, if I wanted to, if I wanted to um, g calculate the distribution of um, heights of all people in Brazil. Now I know some of you are not from Brazil. Let's pretend. Um, 
I would, there's one way I could do it. I could go around to every person in Brazil and measure their height, and then I'd have the exact distribution. That's a bit labor intensive. I probably would never do that. I probably would never be able to do that. But what I could do instead is I could use all of you in the audience as my observables. And I could go around and measure each of you, or you could tell me your height. And maybe I exclude the people who are not from Brazil. <laughs> What I would like to be able to do is to estimate the parameters of this distribution I really want, which is the heights of all the people in Brazil, based on just the observables I have by measuring the heights of the people in the audience. What, I'm, what, I mean by the parameter, what do I mean by the parameters? The mean and the variance of assuming a normal distribution. So there's a technique out there called expectation maximization that has been used since the 70s to basically um, help me calculate the maximum likelihood estimate, uh, estimating the, the mean and the variance of all the people in Brazil, the heights. This EM technique, as, I, as you can see, has been around since the 70s. It's used everywhere for everything. Everyone uses it blindly, but it's just a heuristic. We actually have no theoretical guarantees for what it even does. We, have, we don't even know whether it actually estimates the right parameters for that distribution I really care about. So some colleagues of mine at Columbia University have, done, um, have come up with the first non-trivial global convergence analysis of EM. And what they show, and to show you how much of a baby step they took, this is for two Gaussians. Um, but what they showed is EM actually does iterate to converge, so that was already a result, uh, of two equivalent, to one of two equivalent global maximizers at a linear rate, another result, for all possible initial conditions, which was the bigger result. Because prior results to this were, for this particular initial condition, theorem holds. So this is a, a quite um, a powerful result. Moreover, they show it gets the right answer. So this is very comforting to know that for since the 70s, we've been using something that actually does the right thing. One of the reasons I harped on that particular example as an example of a theoretical understanding of something that works in practice um, is, is because of the excitement that people have now with deep neural networks and deep learning. And everyone heard all of the astounding successes that deep learning has had in industry. Um, by the way, it's not just Google, but it's Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon and you name it. Um, all these IT companies are using deep learning everywhere. Moreover, deep learning, as you can imagine, is used in the vision systems for all the self-driving cars. So Uber, Tesla, Waymo, you saw that already. They're using deep learning uh, to help in real time determine what's in front of the car. So this is not hypothetical anymore. I mean, you already heard the many examples in image recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, and natural, tra uh, natural language processing that uh, is used by the IT industry for all the wonderful services that we get through uh, the, those companies. Deep learning is behind all of that. But you know what? We have no scientific understanding of why deep learning works. <laughs> Zero. So uh, Jeff Dean earlier this morning was asked, what are the hot topics? You asked him, one of the hot topics is trying to understand the science of deep learning. And believe me, there are lots of different disciplines who are coming to this problem. So some of my friends in, um, in um, dynamical systems, some of my friends in uh, physics have been thinking about these these hard problems in terms of things like phase transitions, all the kinds of stuff that physicists think about and, and learn all the time. Um, and now, so there are a lot of different communities trying to tackle this 
this question mark. Um, and it's, it's important to tackle it. And one of the reasons it's important to tackle it is if I am a clinician, and I don't know if that clinician is sitting, he was sitting over there earlier this morning. If I am a clinician and I'm trying to decide do I do open heart surgery or not? And I'm basing it on what the deep learning black box spits out. I am not going to trust whatever that black box spits out. I will want an explanation. Why do you say 0.8? With 0.8 probability, you know, I, I think you should do it. Um, and that's also a hot area of research now. Giving an interpretation, giving an explanation, um, for these black boxes, for these machine learned algorithms, and for these models that are being spit out by these mach mach machine learned algorithms. It's, the, it's really the hot, these two areas are the hottest topics right now in machine learning. Um, and it, it goes to show that in practice, it's just outstanding. I mean, deep learning was one of the machine learning techniques, the other one was reinforcement learning, that enabled AlphaGo to beat human Go players. So it's just outstanding and astound, astounding success with zero scientific basis. And as a scientist, as an academic, that's not acceptable. That's our job as scientists to understand what's going on. That's the basic research. That's pushing the frontiers. Because after all, eventually, it's going to hit a wall. And then we as scientists and we in the academic community had better have something when the, they hit that wall. OK. She gave me a 10-minute warning. <laughs> and we started 10 minutes late. That's OK. I can talk really fast. So, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to see all my slides. Don't worry. Um, now let me get to the applications, because I think many of you will be more interested in that. And I'm going to start with something really easy, biology. So this is an example of using all the big data that we collect from sequencing a DNA of microbiome around pancreatic cancer tumor cells. I know it's a very hot area in biology to look at the microbiome, the bacteria and not just, if you will, the tumor or, or whatnot, because there's a lot of interesting information there. So that's along the lines of where biology is going. But what this group of people have done is they show that the microbiome around the pancreatic cancer tumor cells were counteracting the effect of the chemotherapy used to kill the cancer. In other words, the microbiome was making ineffective the very treatment that was supposed to kill the cancer. So that's not good. But they went one step further. They showed that if you inject for a mouse the uh, antibiotic into the pancreatic tumor, then that antibiotic would counteract the effect of the microbiome and therefore make effective the chemotherapy treatment. So it's like two negatives make a positive. So that was a glimmer of hope. This is very new work. Of course, it's not in clinical trials or anything like that. But it goes to show what you can do if you look at lots and lots of data uh, in terms of DNA sequencing. There's another biology-related, health-related example I wanted to share with you. This work has not even been published. This is really fresh work. It is being funded by the Data Science Institute Seed Grants Award. Um, and it's very exciting because it's about personalized medicine. And the idea here is predicting personalized cancer therapies. So uh, many of you who are in the medical sciences, I don't need to belabor this, but the way in which you're treated if you have cancer is usually today based on the location of your cancer. If you have brain cancer, you're treated one way. If you have lung cancer, you're treated in a different way. If you have stomach cancer, some other way. But what's interesting is it doesn't always work. We, we treat everyone with brain cancer in one way, but not everyone gets well. So what people have found out is that the genomic makeup of tumor, tumors is diverse. 
And each tumor is unique even for the same site of origin. In other words, no two tumors, no two tumors are alike. Wouldn't it be nice to actually treat the tumor that you have? Oh, okay, not you. Let's pretend I have a tumor. I would like, I would like to be treated for the tumor I have. I don't care. Uh, okay, never mind. I won't go into it. But <laughs> this is an example of the kind of maps that um, medical scientists build. Each column represents a patient. Each row represents a gene. Where you see a colored square means there's, in that patient, there's a mutation in that gene. There are 22,000 rows. Now, one thing you'll notice is that it's not clear at all which gene is the culprit here. These are all patients with brain cancer. It's not all clear at all which patient has brain cancer. I mean, which gene is responsible for the brain cancer across the many patients, right? Or maybe it's a multitude of genes, so a combination of genes. We don't know. But it's also not completely random. And it's detecting patterns like this, if there is a pattern that machines are really good at, especially when they're 22,000 rows. And that's perfect for machine learning. Specifically for this project, in terms of personalized cancer therapy, the idea that this group is doing is to use state-of-the-art machine learning techniques like this DNN that you see on the bottom there, and to sequence the brain cancer cells in my head, that's the lower left hand, and then for any given drug, determine which drug for my cancer will be the better outcome for me. That's personalized therapy. And that chart on the right goes to show an early result, which says that this general approach is promising. So this, to me, is really exciting. Because I know in medical science, they, were, they will never do clinical trials on people like me. I'm an outlier in so many ways. And so I'm, I'm relying right now on medical science where clinical trials are undone are more like average populations. So this to me is very exciting. And this to me is what we all want. Another medical story, which ele um, now I'm elevating the level of abstraction in terms of the kind of data, is healthcare data. These, this is uh, the largest federated database of electronic health records in the world. It's coordinated by Columbia University, but you can see there are 25 countries involved, 200 researchers, 80 databases. They're aiming for 1 billion patient records. Currently, they have 400 million unique patients represented in this database. 400 million. And what they've done with this is they've looked at the side effects of certain drug treatments. And this is the beautiful visualization I, want to, I wanted to show you and then tell you some stories about. You'll see that um, each circle of rings represents one of the data sets in this federated data set. So for instance, the top circle in the middle is Columbia University Medical Center. Um, there are three columns here. One on the left is they looked at diabetes, and the middle is hypertension, and on the right is depression. So they looked at three different diseases and how people were treated around the world for those three different diseases. And now let me just tell you two short stories. If I collapsed all the circles in the middle representing hypertension, you would see that one-fourth of the people in this database treated for hypertension are treated uniquely. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to pick on Tom again. <laughs> if Tom has hypertension and he's in his one-fourth, and he asks me, I'm his doctor, Dr. Jeanette, is there anyone else in the world treated like me? My answer to him would be no. That's amazing. 
And this is all observational data. This is not clinical data. This is observational data just through electronic health records. Another interesting story is that looking at the lower left a ring of circles, um, you'll see that those, that ring looks a little different from the other rings. What the ring of circles really is telling you is the inner ring um, indicates the first drug of treatment. If that doesn't work, then a second drug is given to you, and that's the second ring. And if that doesn't work, then a third drug is given you, to you, and that's the third ring, and so on and so forth. And each drug is represented by a different color in, the, in uh, the circles. So what you can see in the lower left-hand corner is that the people in that data set look like they're being treated very differently from everyone else in the world. And it turns out that that is a Japanese medical center. And it turns out that the Japanese have a genetic disposition against this first line of treatment the chartreuse colored representing a, a drug. And then, of course, I asked my colleagues, well, what about the Koreans and the Chinese? Um, and, and they do not have that genetic disposition against that particular drug. So very interesting. You see that from looking at the data. And then, of course, that, that suggests all sorts of uh, medical questions, biological questions, and, and treatment questions. So now for something completely different, history. So we have a very modern history department at Columbia University. <laughs> By that I mean they use data science. They have accumulated the world's largest data set of declassified documents. So every year the United States, and perhaps in Brazil as well, declassifies certain government documents and puts it out for the public. And what this group of people have done is amassed all those declassified documents under one umbrella. And you can see Hillary's emails are there and Kissinger's phone conversations. A lot of the documents are from the 70s. And what were they able to do? Well, let me give you one example. This um, example shows if you just look at the contents of the cables sent between diplomats in the 70s, um, you can actually detect interesting historical events just by looking at the contents of the cablegrams that the diplomats sent each other. And so every black dot represents what the machine th thinks is an interesting historical event. And of course, every black dot is mappable into what happened in the 70s, like the evacuation of Saigon or the death of Mao Zedong. I see this woman here walking with a five-minute sign here. I better start moving faster. So another example of text analysis in a completely different domain is looking at news articles to determine um, market, how the market is going to do. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Should I invest in this? Um, now, using text and using news articles to do that kind of market risk prediction is not new. What this group of people have done is they looked at emerging markets as well as developed markets to see if there's a difference. And they also looked to see whether looking just short term, a month ahead, will have a different effect than looking long term, a year ahead. And what they found is, uh, for both of these different factors, two interesting results. First, that analyzing the news articles is, in some sense gives you more market reaction for the developed countries than for the emerging markets. He also says that, that these, uh, these um, results that they're giving are statistically higher for year ahead prediction, which is interesting because up until now, people have only been looking at short-term effects. Now let me turn to responsible use of data. And I want to share with you this five-letter acronym that I like to use mainly as a mnemonic to remind myself what to talk about. And the acronym is FATES. Fairness, accountability, transparency, ethics, and safety and security. There's a lot of interest right now in the community about uh, bias in algorithms, bias in machine learning models, bias in the data that feeds the algorithms, that produces the models, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and they have, and we all as a community and as a society have right to be concerned um, because a lot of the data that we feed into these algorithms are biased. And if you feed in biased data, you're going to get a biased model out. And then you're going to be using this biased model to make decisions like uh, whether I should, uh, what, what bail I should give someone who's uh, just uh, reoffended. But what I wanted to talk about, and I have a whole talk on this slide, by the way, a whole talk on fairness, accountability, transparency, ethics, safety, and security. So I can't give that whole talk here in five minutes. But I can give you one snippet that speaks to safety and security. And this goes back to DNNs. And remember when I told you that DNNs are used in all the vision systems for self-driving cars? Well, this is why you should be worried. This group of people at Columbia University just last year um, built this tool called Deep Explore. And with this tool, they found thousands of errors in 15 state-of-the-art DNNs. And these are the DNNs that are used in those vision systems for those self-driving cars. So this goes to show astounding success. Hallelujah. But be warned. Be warned. And it's not, it's serious stuff because well, because Uber and Tesla are already in trouble with the kinds of uh, accidents that have happened for, with their cars. Now I want to talk, I'll close very soon, two stories on tackling societal grand challenges. The first addresses social justice. Uh, this is a, a research effort jointly done with a professor in social work and a professor in natural language processing in the computer science department. What they did was they analyzed tweets from a Chicago gang. And the, Chicago is known for gangs and lots of violence, unfortunately. It turns out that the language in which the gang members communicate with each other, this tweet language, is in itself its own language. So they speak with emoticons, swear words, abbreviations, um, symbols, uh, words that don't look like nouns or verbs, uh, its own language. So the first thing we had to do was actually do a parts of speech analysis on this, this, this little language. Um, and once one was able to do that, then you could take off the shelf NLP systems and process that language to build classifiers, for instance, to determine whether the sentiment of a tweet being sent was expressing a sense of loss or a sense of aggression. And so why is that important for social justice? The idea is something like this. I'm a Chicago gang member, and I use this language to communicate with my friends. Suppose someone in my gang was just killed. I might start tweeting with my friends saying, I'm really sad, I feel um, you know, depressed. Why don't we get together and mourn together? That would be a sense of loss. Or I might start tweeting, I'm upset, I'm angry, I want to go out and kill someone. And that's where you want the social workers or even law enforcement to intervene and prevent an actual act of violence. So that's the long story to go to justify and explain why this work is being done. That's the hope. Um, and the, this um, group of researchers is working with social workers in Chicago who work actually very directly with the Chicago gang members um, because uh, they really want to do, do good. My last story something completely different, but something I think is so relevant for Rio and something so relevant for the Brazilian National Academy of Sciences has to do with climate science. And this is where there's this assistant that we're building at Columbia University that's an open source platform where climate scientists can plug in their data, plug in their models, plug in their tools, and everything is open source, so shared and available to everyone. And they're using that kind of platform to do simulations like this, whoops. I, 
I guess I'm not going to show you the simulation. Let's try one more time. There we go. This is a simulation of the ocean currents on Earth. It is uh, based on two petabytes of data. Uh, this is not done by uh, Columbia. This is done by NASA and JPL. But this is just really remarkable. And of course, we, whenever I see this sort of visualization and simulation, I always want more. You know, I want more than the oceans. I want to be able to zoom in and out. Um, I want to see all the interactions of all the systems. Uh, lots and lots of data that the climate scientists collect. Why don't we put it all in there, not just the oceans? Um, and I'm told that the IPCC this year will be collecting over 100 petabytes of data, um, potentially to simulate. Um, really challenging uh, computationally, co challenging with respect to visualization, um, but the potential to tell stories is, is phenomenal, phenomenal. So this open source platform is being used at Columbia for very different applications, including hydrology, thunderstorms, uh, weather, you, you name it. So let me close there and just remind you, remind you of my tagline, Data for Good, and I might have time for one question or so. Thank you very much. Do I have time? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. All right. Now, we have two or three questions. Platea, King. Alguma pergunta? Além da... Você vai perguntar? Uh, sim, sim. Uh, uh, Dr. Janet, thank you for your Não lively alto, talk. Ah, acho que é mais perto. Né? Uh, my question is about, uh, we are talking about sharing data in a global scale. And I wonder what is your thoughts about uh, regulation in a global scale? What do you think about that? And if you have any thoughts. Or... Before I can talk about sharing data at the global scale, and um, one has to, first of all, uh, talk about what is the data that you want to share and what is the purpose for sharing. If we're talking about a scientific community, I think, of course, we all want to share data so that we can advance science uh, much more expeditiously. And then I think what's needed are some common standards, some common understanding for, for that sharing. If I talk about the kind of data that um, companies collect about us, then there's a very different story. And then I think where um, what's germane there are the kinds of uh, regulations, for instance, that EU GDPR has put on many multinational companies, and certainly companies that have um, uh, you know, offices, if you will, in Europe. So the global D data protection regulation um, is certainly cha changing the habits and behaviors of a lot of multinational companies and, of course, American-based companies. Um, but there, there, I don't see that uh, one idea would be for the, some kind of international standards that everyone would agree on. But because, uh, uh, um, because countries and cultures have different stances on th something as fundamental as privacy, I don't see that common set of standards happening very soon. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, my question mo goes more in the, in, in the direction of how to make scientific data more an, uh, amenable to, to use by data science. I mean, you show some examples of people actually collect large amounts of data and uh, in, in genomics or, or in climate science, but like most of science still actually produces uh, bar graphs and puts them in a paper, and what you get is not actual data, but like little interpretations, very biased usually, and, and, and we actually have to go back and extract from, I mean, it's a very stupid way to, to, to synthesize science in terms of how it's published. Uh, you've seen some traction in terms of, okay, we sh you should share your data. One, people are scared of it. Uh, two, if, even if journals require it, it still makes somebody puts up some Excel spreadsheet in whatever format. So uh, 
my idea is that, that, that most of biological science at this are in a very sorry way in terms of informing data science. So how do you think we can improve that? How can you make scientific data uh, more amenable to, to analysis? This is, a, this is a terrific question because I think not until we can share data with each other, even within one discipline, can we benefit from the large amount of data that all of us are collecting individually. And I, especially in the medical sciences and healthcare and, and, and so on, I think there's such tremendous potential if we can share this data with each other. But it's got to be up to the individual community to want to do that because it's, you know, we as scientists are very bottom-up kind of people. We do not like it when people from above tell us what to do. Um, you know, that's, that's nature being in, in academe, right? Um, and, but I do believe that scientists always want to advance their science. And if they if collectively a, a community recognizes that the way to advance science is to come up with, for instance, a set of standards of just the formatting of the data so that we can actually make progress together more quickly, that's, everyone's going to want that. So for example, the Odyssey data set that I showed you, showed you, those 600 million electronic health records, believe it or not, are all in the same format. Can you imagine getting 25 countries to, and all the 80, but in order to join the Odyssey to benefit the whole, you have to put it in, in the same format. It's not an onerous format, um, but you get the benefit of, from sharing. And one of the, if I might just continue on this particular thread, one of the advances that I see, especially in medical science, is if we have a large amount of data about lots of patients with the same disease or same problem, for instance, um, we can build a better predictor. We can build a better classifier. But we are constrained in the sense of each hospital probably has certain regulations that they need to abide by. They can't share the data with each other. However, there are privacy-preserving technologies that will allow individual parties to share data without revealing the contents of the data. These are applied crypto cryptographic techniques like homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation. These are statistical techniques like differential privacy. And I think we, in the, I, I know in the medical community it's very conservative, um, but I think that there are um, already uh, experiments being done using these advanced techniques so that hospitals, for instance, can share data with each other. And the idea is, once you can do that, you can build an uber machine learning model based on all that data that will be a better predictor than any one hospital can build itself. Thank you. I don't see Hello. any other. Oh, one, Hello. More, one Hello. more question only. That, yeah. that, uh, uh, hi, Professor. Thank you for that brilliant presentation. Um, I'm Marcos. I'm from uh, AI uh, company here in Brazil, and uh, we have um, carrying uh, research for 10 years, and one problem we solved, uh, it's a maximization uh, related to expectation maximization. We solved uh, the iris problem that was, it's uh, supposed not be uh, solved with, uh, for separation uh, with clustering. And uh, for, for example, we, <coughs> we could, uh, uh, separate the iris iris data sets with um, really good uh, aspects so what what I can say we uh, have uh, a lot of research and uh, products and we are a scale up company and we want to know how to uh, work together with Columbia University uh, to um, use uh, the the network of Columbia and researchers and uh, and uh, in a in a ways that we can uh, grow up to the, uh, the international market. Is that just just uh, just a case? Uh, so, uh, so you um, let me just understand. You are uh, representing an AI company. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I, as I'm, I'm going to restate this to all of you who might be representing companies in the audience. Um, the Data Science Institute would more than be more, would be more than happy to work with any of you who might be interested, for instance, in becoming an industry affiliate. And besides you know, working with our students through a capstone, an industry affiliate also gets direct access to our students and faculty. So for instance, if you wanted to sponsor a research project, 
on a specific topic that you care about with a specific data set that you have, and you find this expert a faculty member who's interested in that, you could sponsor research for that faculty member, you could sponsor graduate student or postdoc or whatever it takes to actually do that project. So that's the kind of access being an industry affiliate with the Data Science Institute gives you. But moreover, you, it's, it's, it's more, let me, let me be more open to everyone. Um, you know, I, uh, one of the first things I did when I joined Columbia last July is I did go o around the entire campus. I met with every single dean. I met with lots of different faculty, and I basically sent the message, we want to collaborate with you. Data, the Data Science Institute is for you. And I want your sensibilities, I want your kinds of interesting data sets to be working in partnership with us. And this is to all disciplines and all professions. Um, and so for, for, for any of the professors in the audience, if there are ways that we can collaborate on a one-to-one -one or a, a project, we'd be more than happy to, to collaborate. Uh, I know how difficult it is to do that. So um, I'm just welcoming everyone with, an op with open arms. Thanks very much, Annette. Thank we you. have to we'll move okay, on to our you. session. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks for your talk. <laughs>